uh, Israel foreign minister Cass, he he called, he actually asked the Wang Yi to call him. So he contacted the Wang Yi. So Wang, Wang Yi had uh, had a conversation with him, a phone conversation. And that happened on the 14th, October 14th, the 10, 11 in the evening. Mm. And almost right after that, the 11.06, right, based on the readout. So Wang Yi called the Iranian foreign minister, yeah. uh, Arachi, I think that's his name. Yeah. Uh, so clearly it's, Israel is asking China to pass along some message. Is that how you yes. interpret it? Um, what what message does Israel want China to pass along? Right. What I think what has happened is that Israel has been moving um, all out for war against Iran, and you know they attacked Hezbollah, they assassinated Nasrallah, they launched the Pager attack, they have done all kinds of things. The Israeli army has entered Lebanon, was fighting. And not apparently gaining, doing very much, gaining very much ground. But anyway, that's another story. And then what happened, even as the euphoria and, you know, the confidence was you know, bubbling up to the surface, what then happened is that Iran launched its missile strike. All over the media now, the Financial Times, the Daily Telegraph in Britain, many places in the United States, it's suddenly acknowledged that most of the missiles actually, the Iranian missiles actually got through. I'm hearing a report that up to 36 hit one Israeli airbase, the one at Nevatim, which is an important airbase. And yesterday, or was it the day before yesterday, uh, a, a critically important article in the Financial Times admitting that Israel is out or almost out of air defense missiles and that the United States isn't able to supply more. So Israel suddenly discovers, my God, the Iranians are much more powerful in military technology than we expected. And the Americans can't step in and help us. Mm -hmm. And if it, we find ourselves in a long-term war with Iran, we are going to be exposed to devastating counter-strikes by Iran that we can't counter. So two weeks now, more than two weeks since the Iranian strike, the Israelis promised the strike, the credibility of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his, the stability of his government depend on Israel carrying out some kind of a strike against Iran because they said that that was what they were going to do. And I think their supporters expect them to do it. They don't want to be in a long war. At the same time, they now know that Iran can hit back and hit back hard. So what I think they're trying to do is they want to carry out some kind of strike, but they also want the Iranians not to respond too strongly to it. It's the usual story. So how do they get around this? How do they do that? They contact the Chinese, who they know are good friends with the Iranians. By the way, they've also been contacting the Russians. And they're trying to say, look, we're going to carry out a strike, but it's not going to be quite the big, bad strike <laughs> that we intended at the beginning. We're going to try and do a smaller, precise, lethal, surprising strike. Um, when we do it, can you please not attack us in the way that perhaps you might have done? And if you do that, we'll 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 try and walk away from this whole horrible business. I, I think that is what is going on. I think that is what the Americans and the Israelis are trying to convey to the Iranians. Now, whether the Iranians are going to listen is, of course, another matter. Mm. Whether the Chinese or the Russians are impressed, I think, is another matter again. Um, but anyway, I think that is what the Israelis are trying to say. Well, but um, I guess the reason they contacted both China and Russia is because they want to convince the Iranians, right? Because they, they yeah. don't believe only the U.S. pass along the information the Iranian will buy buy them? Is that what, why? Because in the past, well, I uh, thought, right? Go ahead. No, no, you're completely right. I mean, the Americans have been passing information backwards and forwards between Iran and uh -huh. Israel, and they've been doing it through the Iranian embassy in Qatar. Qatar has okay. been acting as the sort of, you know, uh -huh. conveyor 
of all of this. Um, but you're absolutely right. American credibility with Iran has completely collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranian president, who spoke to, of all people, Macron, he said this very straightforwardly. Look, when the Hamas chief, Hania, was assassinated in Tehran on the very same day that I was inaugurated president of Iran, we were going to strike back. But then the Americans came and the Europeans too. And they came and told us, no, don't, don't strike at Israel because mm -hmm. we are going to negotiate a ceasefire in Gaza. And um, if you strike at Israel, that will prevent that ceasefire from being agreed. So don't do that. Hold back. And the Iranians talked about it, talked about it with, each, with themselves. And they decided that that was what they were going to do. And instead of there being a ceasefire in Gaza, what they got was the pager attack, the yeah. attacks on uh, uh, Hezbollah, the advance into southern Lebanon, the assassination of Nasrallah. So, of course, they don't believe. And you know, this is actually there. It's in the Iranian reader of the conversation with, um, with Macron. The Iranians <laughs> don't believe what the Americans are telling them anymore, or the Europeans are telling them anymore. Whereas, by contrast, China, above all, Russia, to a certain extent, are Iran's friends. China, uh, Iran is going to be meeting with the leaders of these countries in, I think it's two weeks' time, in Kazan. Yeah. So what the Chinese and the Russians say carries credibility. But, of course, what the Chinese and the Russians themselves believe now is another yeah. matter. Yeah. Well, I don't believe them. I mean, no. I live in the United States. What, what Biden just, uh, I mean, they just reported mm. that the same Blinken and uh, I think uh, somebody else, they jointly said that, OK, Israel, you need to give a humanitarian, you know, get that humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, within 30 days, otherwise, you know, after 30 days, we're doing, you know, we're going to have a, some kind of weapon embargo or something. Nobody believes it. No, I don't believe I it. Don't. No, no. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, it's absolute. It's absolutely. It's absolutely ridiculous. When they say things like that, um, I mean, you just know that they're talking nonsense and that they don't even believe it themselves. And they're lying again. They're always lying. And when yeah. you lie all the time, in the end, nobody believes anything you say. I think Austin is and uh, Blinken. Uh, do you think they they said that now? Thirty days notice. Thirty days is after the election, so they are trying. Mm. They're they're still trying to get some Arab votes. Is that what they're doing this no. and making that yeah. okay without mm. promising, <clears throat> without needing to to deliver? Because then it will be after the election. That's what they're doing. Yes, is that right? I, I, that's exactly right. The trouble is, I don't think those Arab voters in Michigan be, and yeah. elsewhere yeah. believe them either anymore. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, I always want to ask you this question. <clears throat> well, there, there's so many conflicts going on, right? It, including what's going on in Ukraine. And the, clearly, to me, it's like a war everywhere. <clears throat> but when I look at it, none of them really declared a war. So why yeah. is that? Even in Ukraine, it's called a special military operation, right? <coughs> in, in in Gaza, it's either fighting terrorists or defend yourself, you know, what have you. So what's the difference uh, when you declare a war versus you don't declare <clears throat> war? Why are they well, not declaring war? <laughs> well, that's it. That that is an excellent question. It's one I get asked all the time, by the way, <laughs> by lots of people. And it's a very good one. Um, basically the concept of the declaration of war basically ended with the Second World War, because in theory, the only party that is legally entitled to declare war on behalf of any state is the Security Council of the United Nations. If you go to Chapter yeah. 7, it is the United Nations, the Security Council, that has the sole right to take that kind of action. That was the idea that all the great powers agreed to um, at the end of the Second World War. Now, what the, what the UN Charter also says is that um, any country can take action to defend itself in its own self-defense 
until the Security Council takes action. So what they're all doing, in theory, the, the, the way they try to stay on the right side of the law is that they try to conduct wars without declaring war, operating <clears throat> under the fiction that eventually the Security Council will step in <laughs> and, uh, uh, and act in their place. So that way they can all say that they're acting in an entirely legal way without actually doing so. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reality of the world today. In, in, in the case of the Russians, they called it a special military operation precisely in order to avoid using the word war. And when um, China and India both refer to it as a war, which of course it is, the, 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 the Russians said, oh, no, 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 you mustn't do that. <laughs> this isn't actually a war. It's only a special military operation. The Chinese, by the way, I've noticed, have paid no attention. <laughs> they do refer to it as a war, which is what it is. Well, then in that case, in the future, nobody would declare war then. I mean, you don't have any benefit to declare war, right? Well, <laughs> well that's right. That is absolutely, I mean, it, it actually, if anything, uh, reduces the threshold. Because the, if you're talking about the pre-1945 uh, mechanism, the idea was that you set out your demands, you back those demands with an ultimatum, you said, if you don't agree to my demands, then we will be at war. And if the other side, the side that was presented with the ultimatum, didn't agree to those demands, then you would come and formally declare war. So that that was the that was the sort of legal process that had evolved over time. Now, of course, nobody presents ultimatums or makes demands in that kind of way, and we just go ahead to war. Except we don't call it that. Um, the other thing I notice is that um, there is an article on the Guardian. The, the The title says Israel is a rogue nation; it should yeah. be removed. From the United Nations. This is a uh, Mehdi Hassan who wrote that. I'm a little bit surprised that an article like that would get published, yeah. but I do agree with what he said. I'm I'm not a big fan of Mehdi Hassan, by the way. But yeah. anyway, I I do agree with the, some of the things he said. That he said that Israel's attack on the UN personnel is unprecedented. I I do notice that too, yeah. including just yeah. recently they attacked the Lebanon UN mm. peace, peacekeeping forces. There are some Chinese in there. That's again, got lots of attention in China mm. because mm. years ago there was somebody, there, there is a Chinese got killed in, I think Lebanon, um, part of the uh, UN peacekeep, peacekeeping forces. I think not only the UN personnel got unprecedented attack by Israel, mm. but also journalists, reporters, or somebody did some research, so, you know, showing um, ever since October 7th, which is a year ago, mm -hmm. there, there mm -hmm. has been more, like almost twice as many reporters being killed than the whole 20 years of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, that's staggering numbers. So like, so why Israel so doesn't care anything any, any way anymore? I mean, it doesn't even seem care whether you're a reporter or you're UN peacekeeper. It doesn't care anything anymore. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I should say I agree with you about Mehdi, Mehdi Hassan. I'm not a fan of his either. That is the first thing to say. Um, mm -hmm. th the second thing to say is that Israel is not going to be expelled from the United Nations. <laughs> but it is behaving in exactly the way he says. It is absolutely out of control. Mm -hmm. And it is simply ignoring all restraints or legal or moral restraints as well. And the fact that someone like Mehdi Hassan is now writing articles like this shows you how bad this behavior by Israel has become. Because he's not normally the sort of person you'd expect mm -hmm. to be uh, writing articles of this kind. And it's also the case that it's surprising in a way that The Guardian of all places is publishing things yeah, like this. Yeah, I was remember Jonathan, mm -hmm. I mean, remember Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Friedland, who's a major... Uh, writer for The Guardian, is an outspoken supporter for Israel, and he's a major editorial writer for The Guardian as well. So it just shows you how bad the behaviour is. Now, 
the reason it has become so bad, the reason it's become so reckless and dangerous and extremely violent, the reason Israel is able to attack UN personnel and kill people, kill people from China and all, all sorts of places in the world and behave with incredible aggressive rudeness towards the UN and its agencies is because they know that whatever they do, the United States and the Western countries will support it. And that there is no real limit to what it can do, because whatever it does, however bad its behavior is, it will continue to get that support. So that, of course, nearly encourages Israel to go further and further and further. We saw this again after the attack, after the assassination, the murder of Ismail Haniya in Tehran, what did the Western powers do? They criticized Iran for threatening yeah. Israel. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, uh, when you have something like that going on all the time, you have no, you, you, you have no incentive beyond your own conscience to hold back. And, of course, if you start committing crimes, then, of course, your conscience gradually shrill you know sh shrivels uh, and uh, you know you have to just keep going because that is the nature of crime once you've started on that course you the compulsion is always to continue and to to do it even more and to go go in deeper